Hi everyone, if you're an existing subscriber, hello and welcome back. If you're new to my channel, hello, welcome and why not hit subscribe now? I'm your host, Alicia Vittoria Keen, and I've been interviewing inspirational people and businesses to find out how and why they inspire others. This week, I interviewed Bold as Brass podcast host, Melissa. Here's how it went. Hello and welcome to the channel. To begin with, if you could just introduce yourself, who are you and what do you do? Thanks so much for having me. I'm Melissa Brown. I'm primarily a classically trained trombonist uh, music teacher, um, but most recently the host and producer of Boulder's Brass podcast. How did you end up doing That's a kind podcast? of what I spent most of my time. Well, we've got COVID to, th to thank for, for very little other than the fact that I now have a podcast. Um, so in whenever it was March, the first lockdown, a lot of my teaching went online, but a lot of it wasn't happening. And I was living in a flat, so there was only so many hours a day I could practice before my neighbours wanted to kill me. Um, and so I had a lot of spare time and I just didn't know what to do with myself. And I'd been sort of throwing around the idea of doing some sort of interview based something for a long time. I didn't know whether I wanted to run a channel like yours or if I wanted a podcast. Um, and I realised that I already didn't know how to audio produce let alone video and audio produce. So I thought, let's go one thing at a time. And so I sort of did a little bit of research and asked a few people, you know, is this the sort of thing that's interesting to anybody? And there was a positive enough response that I thought, well, why not? I, I do a few interviews. If nobody listens to it, then we stop it. And I've learned something new. And as it happens at this point, we've been running for about eight months. There are 38 episodes, I think, as of yesterday, live in the world, uh, with about 5,000 plays in total now. So it's wow. it's gone pretty well. <laughs> That's phenomenal. A huge well done to you. Thank you. It's very different to your teaching. Did any of your skills from teaching kind of go over to your podcast? That's a really good question. Um, I think that the main thing that comes across from teaching is I'm quite used to standing up and talking in front of 30 people, mm -hmm. 30 small people, and you've got to try and keep their attention for quite a long time. Um, so I thought if I can manage to do that, I can manage to grab the attention of one adult at a time, surely. But that's probably about it. That and my, my existing knowledge of the the brass industry so my podcast mostly is interviewing other professionals from from my tiny corner of the music industry um, and so i had a bit of background there i knew a few people already that i could call up a lot were uh, friends from college or old teachers so that was definitely helpful um but other than that it was all new starting from scratch what would you say has been one of the most difficult hardest parts of starting your own podcast Oh my goodness. Um, now, not so many of them. I think if you'd asked me that in March, I'd have said absolutely everything is terrifying. Um, I didn't know anything about, well, I should really preface this with the fact that I'm absolutely terrible with computers. Any of my students will tell me I, a, a Zoom lesson is is quite impressive for me. So I knew nothing about the, the mics that I would need. I didn't know anything about hosting a uh, royalty free music that was it was stuff that I was aware of. I just didn't know where to start with looking for it and, and getting it. So that that probably was hurdle number one. The thing that I've found I've needed to work on the most is uh, marketing and connecting with an audience and growing that audience it, you know, I've barely ever even use my my own personal instagram i spent all my time on boulders brass interacting with other people and 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 doing things there that i never would have even thought about doing before because it well it wasn't necessary um so that's probably it learning about the tech and learning about the marketing completely new a lot of people don't realize how much does go into creating a podcast creating even if you say a short sort of 15 minute podcast you're probably looking at I know for me, I don't know whether this is the same for you, probably at least 25 minutes of chat before you can even get that. So then it takes all the editing. That's absolutely it. So I, I've started running a Patreon platform to try and get some funding because actually um, it, it costs money as well. You know, you've got to host it and then it is the editing hours, exactly as you say. And I try to tell people that for every 30 minutes of content they hear, I've spent at least an hour producing that because it's at least the half an hour that you spend recording it. Then 
about i say one and a half times the amount of the episode goes back into editing so you know it, it it's a lot of time goes back into producing the whole thing so yeah you're absolutely right and then you've got finding the people how have you found these people i know you said some of them are from like college friends what about the others so uh, i i'm a bit cheeky the whole thing is based on me just asking favors out of lots of nice people and I'm very grateful for the fact that they are all really nice people and they all kind of just say yes so I started off just um, as I said going through my phone book and seeing like who have I got um, and the first five guests were my teacher before college a friend of mine who's in the army a friend of mine who plays for an opera orchestra another teacher of mine and then a recommendation of the first person so then I thought hmm Okay, the first person recommended somebody else. So then I kind of just asked each guest to then recommend a friend of theirs mm -hmm. that probably I didn't know. And and so far, you know, only one person said no to coming on the podcast. Um, and, you know, to be fair to them, they were very open about it. They just said, I'm not very good at talking about myself. And that's fine. I'm not there to hold a gun to anyone's head and make them talk to me. And, you know, I've now got 50 episodes booked. And if in all, all that time, only one person said no, I've been pretty lucky so far. What would you say to someone else who's starting a podcast who's looking for guests? What would you say to them? I think it depends on the angle that you're going for. So I think, first of all, you absolutely need to know who you're marketing your show to and what you want to gain from it. So I always knew that I wanted mine to be an interview based podcast with other people from my profession. It kind of all stemmed really from uh, a question my grandma's husband always asks me, which is, what gigs have you got coming up? And I say to him, well, actually, Gordon, I haven't got very many gigs coming up, but can I tell you about some of the other projects I'm doing? And he's just not interested. He only wants to know what I'm playing. And it kind of makes me cross because I think my job has so much more than that. And every brass player I know does several different things we all have this what we call a portfolio career and i wanted to be able to show that off you know show all of these different things that other people do so i teach and i do a podcast but other people do wellness and yoga the links in with their playing career you know there's loads of different stuff going on um so for me i had a really clear idea of of what i wanted the outcome to be and so then i knew who to ask so i think find the people that closest to you that you know already that match your criteria because that's all I did as I asked people that I like I respect I work with regularly I'm in decent contact with to basically do me a favor and so luckily they said yes um, and from there as it as it grows you can ask you know people that maybe you don't know or the episode I had that went live yesterday um, a, a jazz trombonist and singer called Aubrey Logan I am the biggest fan of her and her music, okay? This episode came about because somebody said, who are your three dream guests in a Q&A on Instagram? And I, I wrote her name down on my list. I didn't tag her. So she found the story and she said, okay, go ahead, let's make it happen. I didn't ask her, but that was she was number one on my list of dream guests. I never thought I'd be interviewing this person that I idolized. So... At the beginning, I would never have thought about approaching her and asking her. So start with the people you know, let it grow. And if you can, get people to recommend other people or suggest other people, because then you've got somewhere to, to grow out from. That makes sense. And thank you for that bit of advice. You have been very successful within the short amount of time you've been doing it. You've had, what, 4,500 plays, did I see, just before Christmas? Yeah, so as of right now, I can tell you exactly because it's in my browser behind this window, 4,800 4, at this present moment. That's fantastic. So do you think doing something that you're passionate about, you're obviously a brass player yourself, do you think that's what's helped? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The amount of time I put into this, I set aside one day a week where I either record, edit, book promote whatever that happens on one day a week and i have to have that time otherwise it just wouldn't ever happen and i think you can't afford to set aside that time unless you really care about it now i i'm very lucky i am getting to call up people from my industry and basically i'm getting free career advice free lessons free wellness training all of this stuff just by running my interviews and 
I think if I wasn't fully invested in it, that wouldn't benefit me at all. Um, and I think I'm, I'm really, really fortunate that I did care about it. I wanted to do something similar to this for a while. And I'm glad that when the ball got rolling, it kept rolling. Um, but as I'm sure you find with your, your channel as well, you've got to put in the time and to keep the momentum up. You've really got to invest yourself in it. So absolutely, yeah. I think that goes for anything, what you kind of do in life. If you're not invested in it completely, and you don't put the time in, then you're probably not going to do as well as what you would if you do set that time across. You do, you are passionate about it. Absolutely. Now, in terms of like your interview techniques, I was having a conversation with someone the other day who also does interviewing and they were saying how they do it is, they literally just sit down. They don't have a script or anything. How, how do you find it works for you? So I'm the other way around, actually. I Everything okay. is fairly scripted. Um, there, there are a few reasons for this, though. One is um, I'm, I'm asking people from my profession, so I know what their workload is like. I know mm -hmm. how busy they are. I wanted them to know exactly what they were getting into. So actually I issue them the questions before their interview. So they have time to prepare if they want to. Because essentially I'm asking them to tell me from the second they started playing music through to the present day, their life story. Mm -hmm. I think if I didn't have those questions in advance, I'd miss loads of stuff out. So I want them to have chance to prepare. But one of the podcasts I took influence from, which is called Entry Level, it's essentially the same sort of um, interview format, but by a comedian for comedians he has uh brooks whelan is the host i should be fair to credit him he has the same sort of opening questions for every uh, every single episode so when you start listening you're like oh i know exactly who i'm listening to i know what what podcast i'm listening to and you're you're there it's familiar it's um you know it's structured similarly and i thought actually i quite like that element so you know i, I borrowed the ideas let's call it borrowing that's how we call it in the arts right we borrow ideas <laughs> um and so that that's kind of where where i got the idea of having it scripted from it also means that around my day job when i do come home from work and i've got an interview half an hour after getting in from work or i'm jumping on in the middle of like teaching i've got some lessons in the morning and some in the afternoon i'm interviewing them in the middle I know what I'm doing, <laughs> it keeps me on track. You know, I know exactly how it's gonna run. I know roughly how long it's gonna take. Um, it, it's never a surprise for me or for, for the guests. So I think it probably just helps me uh, keep in, in, the, in the right zone. <laughs> Can we have a taster then? So what's your first sort of, I don't know, two, three questions? So the, I, I have exactly the same setup as you. I let my guests introduce themselves. First question is always, take us back to the beginning. What first drew you to playing music and how old were you? So that's always the first one. And then it is scripted, but it kind of depends a little bit on how much of a first answer we get. If we get, you know, the whole of their childhood, secondary school career, all the way through music college. And then we're, how did they get into the music profession? The conversation gets steered one way. Sometimes we just get a, I had lessons in primary school. So then obviously we need to know more. So that's probably the part where I'm most adaptable in the interviews. After that, it's it's pretty much you get to hear their whole playing up until they became a professional. Um, then the sort of um, projects they've been involved with that were highlights. I have a three word or three short phrase question about uh, their worst or weirdest concert memory uh, which is supposed to hopefully keep everyone out of trouble um and then it's on to some slightly more broad spectrum what's your favorite piece of music to play what do you like to listen to those sorts of things and then i finish it off with a, a quick fire type of non-musical thing just to see how people think and that's kind of the broadest sort of overview i'm going to ask you the same question then take me back to the beginning where did it all start for you so um, I grew up in a family of, of brass players. My, um, my dad plays the tuba, um, which for anyone that's uh, watching or listening and doesn't know what that is, that's the, the big socking brass instrument. Um, it's about three and a half foot tall. It's enormous. And that's what my dad plays. Um, and I remember asking, and I'm sure at some point my parents are going to correct me on the ages that I give out in this story. I, I think I was about seven when I started asking, when can I go to band practice? You know, it was a big shiny piece of metal. You blew in one end and it made a fotting sound. 
sold. I wanted to have a go. So when I was nine, um, you get told as a brass player that you need to have your adult front teeth to be able to play yeah. the instrument successfully. As a teacher, I'm going to call bullshit on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> apologies if you, you can beat me out if I'm not allowed to swear here. Um, no, I don't fine. I don't really believe that at all. I believe that children are adaptable and if they want to learn, you should let them learn. But anyway, I was nine years old when I was first allowed to try out an instrument. And I tried out a cornet, which is kind of like a short, fat version of the trumpet. Same pitch, looks kind of different, looks like it's been squashed. That was no good for me. Went up to a slightly bigger instrument. I liked it a little bit more, still wasn't right. Saw a concert, our band that was based in Chatteris uh, had a band president. He is a professional trombonist. He's one of the best professional trombonists. He came and did a concert with the band and I was like, I found it, that's the one I want. And that was over about a four year span. It took me to find the right instrument for me. Um, it's a bit sort of Harry Potter-esque, um, the instrument you'll find the one that fits you rather than picking the one that you necessarily want to play there's one that works better i think for most people than others the trombone was the one for me um so as i said my dad plays um my brother plays there's three of us in the family all playing brass instruments but all playing different ones to each other how weird that you've all chosen different instruments as well i never realized that i always just thought if you want to play something then so be it yeah, I mean, I think you can go that way. I think with brass instruments specifically, because I'll just grab my mouthpiece off the stand here, just so I can sort of show you a bit better. So these all come in different sizes and, you know, they've, you've got to feel comfortable on your mouth. And with the rest of the instrument as well, it kind of depends on how big you are or how comfortable you find the fit of the instrument. Um, for me, I've got quite a big mouth. Everyone knows that. I spend half of my life talking. Um, a slightly bigger mouthpiece was good for me um but as i said my brother plays the trumpet and the mouthpiece is a lot smaller it works for him so i think that there, there definitely is one that that works better for others i think with with the different instruments you know, guitar piano it's probably slightly broader spectrum but in terms of brass i think there's definitely one that fits for everybody slightly more comfortably so how come you ended up teaching was it your passion from such a young age <laughs> This is one of my favorite questions to answer, because if you ask any of my friends or any of my teachers in secondary school, I was adamant I was never going to teach. Never. I didn't have Not the patience like for it. Oh, I mean, my my French teacher, I think, was the one that, that told me, um, you you have not got the patience for teaching. That's rude. <laughs> Probably true. Um, what actually happened was um, when when you're at music college, as well as studying um, the performance of your instrument, which is primarily why we all go to, to conservatoire, as they call them, makes us sound really poncy. It's brilliant. Um, <laughs> as well as studying performing your instrument, you get the chance to to study lots of modules, especially in your later years. Um, so lots of people do conducting. Mm -hmm. Lots of people figure out how to arrange music for different instrument groups. And then there was a module that you could take, which was, it was a double module. You had to do it for two years on instrumental teaching. One side was practical, one side was theoretical. And at the end of those two years, you could graduate with an additional qualification. So you'd graduate with your degree, and then you'd graduate with what they call a licensure in teaching practice. I don't know why they call everything such ridiculous names, but they do. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'll try it out for a year. If I don't want to do the second year, I just won't get the diploma, it's fine. And as it was, I actually was quite enjoying studying it. So I did the full two years. Um, and about the same time as I started that module, I got a call from my old secondary school. Shout out to Abbey College Ramsey. Never thought I'd do that in my life. Um, and they called me up and they said, look, we're desperate for a, for a brass teacher that can teach some piano. We know you can do that. Do you fancy it? I was only 19 at the time. And so I thought, I don't really know that I'm very well equipped, but maybe this is the best way for me to practice mm -hmm. and see whether or not I'm any good at teaching. And I realized that, you know, I was saying things, the students were understanding it and they were making some progress. Okay, maybe it's not, maybe I'm, I'm not so bad at this. So I, I, I worked for the same sort of company that was based from my school for a couple of years. And I realized that I actually was quite enjoying it. Sometimes, obviously, it does depend on the students you've got and the, the schools you're based in, as with pretty much any job. It depends where you are and who you're with. Um, but, you know, in those two years, I realised that I was quite enjoying it. 
but something I have started to speak about slightly more openly and I won't give you the full story because I do go on for ages when I talk about it in my four I started to have a lot of problem with my mental health um, I have a formal diagnosis now of obsessive compulsive disorder OCD that's the one that gets made fun of all the time um, it's all right I make fun of it too but because when I graduated from college and I was having these struggles, OCD, just as a brief overview, isn't just being clean and tidy. It's having repetitive, quite stressful thoughts that just kind of don't leave you alone. But it, it becomes quite difficult to just spend time as you do as a musician in a small room by yourself practicing your instrument because it takes a lot of focus and a lot of discipline. And at that time, it was something I was really struggling with was being on my own, being focused. It's something that untreated OCD was very difficult for me to manage I can do it a lot better now I've had treatment it was very expensive <laughs> but at the time whilst I was teaching I realized I have to get out of my own head and think about somebody else I have to concentrate on this person's needs in their lesson what did they want to achieve musically what are they trying to achieve what's good what's not so good and that whole 30 minutes or 20 minutes however long their lesson was I was not thinking about me I wasn't obsessing over the, the sort of floofy things in my brain. I was completely out of my head, focusing on something else and improving something else. And I thought, oh, this is brilliant. This is wonderful. This is very useful. And so I was lucky when I graduated to then get several teaching jobs that gave me a sort of 80% full time job across several companies. Um, and, it, it, you know, like I say, it came out of something fairly sort of miserable that I became quite good at it. And then I continued to be okay at it. I don't ever say that I'm very good at anything. Um, but, you know, I, I continue to take on teaching work and my students continue to develop. And so when I've needed a new job, that's what I've gone for first. And everything else has been sort of a an aside. So my, my playing is less than it perhaps used to be. It's maybe less than I want it to be. But actually teaching is a far more reliable income. And actually I've been very, very lucky and very grateful for, for the path that, that opened up, like I say, out of something that wasn't particularly positive at the time. Definitely something positive out of like not a great situation. Would you say your teaching side of things helped towards the treatment? In, pro in lots of ways, probably yes. In as much as as I said already, it kept me focused on something else. Um, for a while, probably what I did was work lots and, and not focus on getting better. Um, a sort of tricky thing that I, I feel like I should mention, and I've discussed it a few times in a few of my podcasts, is as a musician, you often worry to discuss these things, injuries, mental health conditions, anything that could prevent someone from booking you for future work. So at the time it was much easier to sort of bury it all nowadays people are a lot more open you know it's uh, I, I graduated seven years ago conversation has come a very long way since then at the time I was still very much trying to keep it a secret so I was trying to put on this very professional face and and keep teaching keep working and that probably might be in the first yeah in the first instance I definitely was just trying to push it down and get on with things and you know these things are kind of like um like volcanoes it'll bubble away for a long time and then suddenly it will just burst forth and then you've got to deal with it because the whole world is covered in lava and you know then things have gone to shit so uh, you know fast forward a few years i was still teaching still working but still trying to keep it under wraps the volcano did erupt i did then have to seek some treatment but at that point i was brave enough to say to people actually this is what's going on this is what i'm struggling with and you know, it, it's not so much the teaching that was that was the benefit then. It was that I was working for understanding people. So I was working for a company where I felt like I could talk quite openly about it to my seniors, to my playing colleagues, to my partner, to my family, whoever. It was it was much easier to sort of say, right, this is out in the open now, and I can kind of crack on with it. Um, but what I am grateful for from the teaching perspective is that it kept me focused on something all the way through. It was kind of my constant. So even when things were bad or when things were good, I had something there that was the same, that wasn't changing. So that, I think, probably is the thing that was the most beneficial. Had you spoken about your situation sooner, would the volcano have erupted or would you have been able to manage it better? Um, I think it's probably fair to say that if I had managed to address it sooner and I'd been sort of able to 
to reach out for help a little sooner i don't think it would ever have come to that sort of eruption point um and th this is it, it is something that i try to encourage of people which is you know <sighs> with mental health it's really easy to say well it's not that bad i know someone that's got it worse everybody's suffering worse than me if it gets to a point <laughs> where you don't feel good about anything if you're miserable about something especially if it's recurrent reach out to somebody so like i say my my treatment was expensive because i decided to find a private therapist um i was living in a new area i wasn't registered with my doctors i didn't know what was available to me where i was living so i found someone private but there is help available for free on the nhs with the samaritans with mind there's so many places you can call up for help and i sort of wish in lots of ways that i'd been a little bit braver sooner i did see one therapist before my really big bout of treatment and she wasn't really qualified to deal with OCD. She was a grief and depression specialist. So I'm sure she's very good at what she does. She never should have taken me on as a patient. So research is, is vital. But yeah, I definitely wish that I'd been brave enough to say, actually, I don't feel so good. Something's not right. I'm having trouble with whatever, work, sleeping, socializing, whatever. And like you say, then probably the eruption would never have happened. I'd have probably gotten a handle on it better sooner. What was the biggest thing you learned from your situation? Obviously not being in a nice situation and having to go through that. What would you say to your old self? Sometimes it's the tough stuff that makes you stronger. It makes you braver. And it's like one of those terrible inspirational quotes that you see across like a sunset picture. That's what I sound like right now. But you know, sometimes these things really are true. Um, I, I wish I'd known that if I spoke up, people wouldn't judge me or push me to one side or forget about me. Um, I wish I'd realized that by being open about it, that you know, even one person might feel braver to talk about their own issues. Um, you know, I'd have probably been healthier. My career might have gone in a different direction. Um, but you know, there's no point in speculating on that one because I, you know, I've been very lucky to get to where I, where I am now. Um, but it is just knowing that you, you can make it through everything. You know, you just need to have the right resources available to you. No, you do. And thank you for sharing that story as well. I think oh, that's no problem. good for the viewers. I want to talk about your podcast again. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned there about speaking out about the mental health side, that you've spoken about it on your podcast, mm -hmm. and you're sharing it now, what you perhaps wouldn't have done before because you didn't want people to know about it in case it affected your career. What's your main goal for that? Is it to help others who are perhaps going through the same? Is it just to share your story? What's your main goal? I think in terms of me speaking about mental health it's just to keep conversations i had a guest that was was quite willing to open up with his struggles with anxiety i've had other people that were willing to talk about playing injuries mm -hmm. um and what actually sparked it was somebody being um a bit of a bell end on facebook um somebody posted a joke about ocd and I called them out about it and they defended themselves without apologizing. And that was the first time I thought, actually, now is my time to say something. And colleagues that had known me for years said we had no idea. And I thought, is that the right thing or the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. So I think from a, from a mental health standpoint, I'm talking about it when I can to... Uh, what's the best way to put it? I've lost all of my good English words to make it a less taboo thing to talk about. It's not something that I think is a huge, it's not like, hi, I'm Melissa and I have OCD type of mm -hmm. focal point in my life. You know, the things that I'll introduce myself with first, or I am a trombonist, I'm a musician, I'm a music teacher, I'm a podcaster. You know, those things are labels that I associate far more closely with. But when I tell my story to people, I think it's really important for me to not put that area of my life into a box and hide it away because it has 
led me to all the paths and all the decisions that have led me to what I do now. So from my point of view, when I talk about myself, I want to try and be as open about it as possible. With the podcast, I try to just keep the conversation as open as possible. If people have stories like mine that they want to share or any other injuries, we've had a cancer survivor within the brass community. We've had people with physical injuries. We've had people, as I say, with anxiety, that if they're willing to talk about it because it has impacted on their career and on their journey as a brass player, then I want to leave the door open for those conversations because I think they really are important for us to have. Um, so yeah, I think they are important for me to include um, if my guests feel like they're relevant to their own stories. I completely agree. I think it's fantastic what you're doing. It's fantastic as well that people are now willing to speak about it because it's definitely something that isn't spoken about enough. Yeah, even now in 2021. Crazy, isn't it? Where do you see your podcast going? Oh, wow. That's a, like the million dollar question, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to keep it going for as long as people want to listen to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love it to pick up a little more traction. Um, obviously, I'm very, very proud of the amount of plays it has received so far and the amount of attention it's gotten. Um, you know, in the last three months, I've done five interviews about my podcast. I didn't think anyone would ever want to talk to me about it, let alone listen to it. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd really love to just open it up to the wider community. I realise that my podcast is fairly niche. Um, it very much is is aimed towards people who play, play brass instruments, either in an amateur or a professional setting, people who have uh, some sort of hobbied interest in it, um, you know, music college students. It, it, it is for, for like one area of the world, but there are so many brass players in the world. Um, surprisingly it's, <laughs> I describe it a bit like you know when you're on the underground and people say you're never more than six feet from a rat yeah. I secretly think you're never more than six feet away from a brass player you just might not know it um so I would like for it just to keep growing from strength to strength I am loving I've talked to players across Europe I've talked to players in America in Canada I've met people virtually that I probably never would have organically met so you know I'm still building relationships uh, as a musician as a person with with people across the world so I mean I'm pretty spoiled as it is um but I'd love for it to just keep going so I can keep doing all those things well, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing really well. So thank you. Huge well done to you. Finally, I do have 10 very quick questions. Are you ready? Absolutely. Let's go. Okay. So your next download milestone that you've got for yourself. 5,000 plays. Well, you're not, not like not far. far. Yep. Trainers or sandals? Oh, I live in my flip-flops when it's not raining, so I guess I have to go sandals. One person you love to interview? Ooh, um, I've been very lucky to interview some people that I never thought I'd get to. Uh, let's go for uh, one of the most famous trombone players in the world, Christian Lindbergh. Okay, next question, Coke or Pepsi? Diet Pepsi. Next question, if you were to design a planet, what would your perfect planet look like? Ooh, um, lots of water, so it feels like you're always next to the sea. Lots of mountains, uh, not very many people covered in dogs. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds like a good planet. (laughs) I'm with you on that one. I would definitely live there. (laughs) You're very fine. Uh, TV or book? Oh, uh, I love to read, but I think the TV's got it on this one. Okay. Favourite instrument that you don't play? Oh, double bass. Okay. If you could only listen to one musician for the rest of your life, who would you choose? Iron Maiden. That is a curveball considering the basis of the rest of my interview. <laughs> <laughs> this next question was going to be winter or summer, but I'm guessing the answer because you said about your sandals. 
I'm also a June born half Cypriot. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's summer. (laughs) I thought so. And final question, one bit of positivity to share with people watching this. Oh, do one thing every day that makes you happy. That's a good one. I really like that. Yeah, I mean, it can be as simple as like, have a cup of tea and uh, watch a YouTube video. Probably one of Alicia's. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> or listen to a podcast, one of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Double plug, amazing. Double plug. Thank you very much for joining me today. It's been great having you on. For people who want to listen to your podcast, where can they check it out? Sure. Well, thanks so much for asking me to come and do this. It's been an absolute pleasure. My podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify. If you just search for Bold as Brass Podcast, um, you can keep up to date with what's going on on the show. We have a Facebook page and we're on Instagram at Bold as Brass Podcast. And the last little plug from me is that if you do come and listen to my podcast and you do like what I do, I do have a Patreon page, which is uh, patreon.com forward slash Bold as Brass Podcast, where people can help me out with the running costs of the show um the lowest subscription is like three pounds a month 75 pence a week um which makes all the difference to me in being able to actually give up time to edit it and pay for the hosting and all the bits of tech um so yeah that's where you can find me fantastic thank you very much no worries thank you it just goes to show that even if you're unsure of how to do something you can learn there's nothing stopping you As we heard Melissa speak about, she's not that great with technology, but she's now producing her own podcasts. Now you can follow Boulders Brass at the links here. If you have someone that inspires you, comment below. I'm always so interested to find out who others find inspirational. Likewise, if you have an inspirational story to tell, comment below, drop me a message on social media, or even drop me an email. On Wednesday, I'll be back here to inspire your story. See you later.